Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, being a jazz conference, I expect a little call and response. You know. <laughs> My name is Orbert Davis on behalf of the board of directors of the Jazz Education Network. I want to personally welcome you to this conference. Um, part of the duties of board members is to preside. And you know, you've, you know, you've been here for days and you we have to talk about the cell phones and, and whatnot. But when I saw this particular clinic, I grabbed it right away. I said, I, I want to be there, so don't book me for anything else. I have to come see this man. <laughs> uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, see, that's the thing. They, you know, they, they said, well, by now, by now, we shouldn't have to say anything about cell phones. But I will say that if you own an um, iPhone, was it the 4S? And if it goes off, it's mine. <laughs> so, the iPhone 4S has a rhythm section in it? Yeah, it has this lady in there that talks to you. <laughs> so leave it on if you don't like it, and I'll, I'll take it off your hands. <laughs> All right, enough of that. But uh, I, I'm so thrilled and honored to, uh, to introduce you to a person who has inspired me my entire professional life. And uh, you are about to, oh, background music, I love this too. Go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> You are about to experience something <laughs> that will change your life. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Ernie Watts. Well, that's a hell of a responsibility, isn't it? Yes. To change somebody's life. Holy cow. Thank you. 
instruments or about playing techniques as we go along. Uh, what I want to do is uh, talk to you a bit, maybe play a bit. If you have any questions as we go along, please raise your hand immediately and then I will address your specific question on, on the spot. So don't worry about interrupting. If I say something that raises a question in your mind, please raise your hand and ask the question, that's why I'm here. You know, this is a uh, this is a workshop, this is a clinic. We're here to experience and exchange information. So, got a question. Mouthpiece and read. Mouthpiece and read. <laughs> Mouthpiece. <laughs> Autolink, 1968, made in Pompano Beach, Florida hand faced by an old dude named Ben Herod, who ran the Autolink factory at the time. 
Uh, this was one of several experimental mouthpieces I had. This is a long story, you asked the hell of a question. <laughs> um, when I was with the Buddy Rich Band, I played lead alto for a couple of years. A wonderful, wonderful uh, tenor player moved back to the United States from Germany, a man named Don Menza, who's an amazing saxophonist. He was making saxophone mouthpieces. And he was making saxophone mouthpieces that were very wide and uh, had a very open sound. So I was playing sa alto saxophone with Buddy Rich, and I was practicing tenor during the day, and I was looking for a, a, a tenor mouthpiece. So I started playing this tenor mouthpiece that I got from Don Menza that was a, a tip opening of 160, which to the auto link tip openings is a number 13. <laughs> So, um, I was playing this mouthpiece and I got very used to the concept, excuse me, I wear this when I play, um, I got very used to the concept of playing a wide mouthpiece with a fairly soft or medium strength reed. I felt like I could get more flexibility out of the sound of the instrument, more colors, more sounds, more nuances of sound. The only thing had to be that I had to control it more. It took more control to control a tip opening that wide. So anyway, as time went by, uh, I left Buddy Rich's band. I started working in Los Angeles doing studio work, playing on records and movies and TV shows and all of these kind of uh, music projects that they do in California. Uh, during that time, I was still playing jazz. So I was playing at a little club in LA called the Baked Potato. It was a, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's turned out to be a, it's turned out to be a, a, a very famous place, wonderful place. I used to work there every Tuesday night for years with Harvey Mason, Lee Rittenauer, Dave Brewson, uh, Patrice Russian. Uh, sometimes uh, Alex Acuna played, Abraham Laboreal, different people. So we had a lot of fun. Tuesdays were uh, very interesting. So <laughs> on one of these gigs, I met Ben Harrod. This is getting us back to the mouthpiece. He's, he was the gentleman that made mouthpieces for Autolink in uh, Pompano Beach, Florida. So. I was interested in getting a darker sound. I liked the tip opening. I didn't like the brightness of the mouthpiece up high. So I asked him if he would make some mouthpieces for me. So he immediately, you know, when I told him what the tip opening was for the mouthpiece that I was interested in, he immediately told me I was crazy. <laughs> but he said that he would make them for me and I would, you know, to, that I would have to pay him for the mouthpieces. So at that time he said, yeah, you're gonna have to pay me for these mouthpieces and they're 40 bucks a piece. So now we know, with, we don't even have to talk about saxophone mouthpieces. Okay, so anyway, you have to take out a loan to buy a saxophone mouthpiece, <laughs> you know. So anyway, um, what happened was he made the mouthpieces he made experimental mouthpieces for me because I was interested in what they would do. So the first thing I did was I had him make three mouthpieces, a 150, a 160, and a 170. So I decided that the 160 was the best. That's the number 13. After that, I had him make three more 160s. And this is one of those. So I've been playing this. This is, the, this is the twin of a mouthpiece I played for years, and it just kind of wore out. It just got dropped too many times, things like that that happen. You, get your, you drop your mouthpiece, you get it fixed. You drop your mouthpiece, you get it fixed. Every time something happens, it makes it a little different. So I eventually changed it out. This one I've been playing. This one was made in 1968. I've been playing it for about, I don't know, eight or nine years now, okay? So that's the, that's the story on the mouthpiece. It's an old auto link. It's a 160 tip opening. I have a wedge that I put in it to spark up the bottom register of the instrument so it wasn't too low key. 
and uh, I had a I had a friend of mine, Phil Barone, make a wedge for this mouthpiece that's in there now. Um, I made a wedge myself. This is another really insane story. There's this stuff that you can get from Michaels or these craft stores. It's called Sculpey. And it's like plasticine. It's like modeling clay. And you can mold it. And then you put it in your oven. And it cooks hard. You know, it makes it into like porcelain. So I made a wedge for my mouthpiece myself. And I stuck it in the mouthpiece with super glue. <laughs> and it was in the mouthpiece with super glue for like 15 or 15 years, right? So every time I'd see the super glue kind of start coming a loose from around the edges, you know, I put another little bit of super glue in it. <laughs> and I kept this thing in my mouthpiece with super glue for years. Meanwhile, I'm doing all of these records, right? I'm, do I'm playing with Marvin Gaye, I'm playing with Quincy Jones, I'm doing orchestral projects, I'm doing orchestral things for films and concerts, and I'm looking down there and there's this wedge in this mouthpiece that's stuck in there with uh, super glue. <laughs> you know, so after a while I start flipping out, right? Because it's like, oh man, this thing's liable to come loose and blow down the inside of the neck of the mouthpiece any time. I'm liable to be at the Hollywood Bowl or something, and, and, and this thing's liable to fall out on the floor. You know? so, <laughs> so I had a better way, better wedge made by Phil Barone, and we got it in there right, and that's what this is. So everything has a story. That's the incredible thing about music. That's the incredible thing about playing an instrument, right? Every instrument, everybody that plays, they have a story about how they get their sound, what their instrument is, why they play their instrument, you know. So anyway, that's my mouthpiece story. So it's a very wide mouthpiece. I've been playing it since 1968, 1969. I practice every day. As long as, I'm, as long as I practice every day, as long as I play every day, I'm okay. If I don't play every day, if I miss a couple of days, I'm huffing and puffing. But there's a thing that happens with sound. And for me to get the sound that I like, I have to have a certain amount of resistance to blow against. I like to put a lot of air through the instrument. When I play, I blow a lot of air. I open my throat and the sound is round. The sound is open. And I have the flexibility all over the instrument. Um, I like to play from the bottom of the instrument to the top and it's very hard to do unless you have a setup where you can play your instrument just about the whole instrument all the time with the same embouchure. So in order to get all the intervals, Right, that's all the saxophone. You know, that's all there is to the saxophone. Right. <laughs> uh, but in order to play the notes at the same time clearly and smoothly, you have to have a setup where you can play the whole instrument with one embouchure. You know, some people play one embouchure on the bottom of the instrument, they play another embouchure in the middle of the instrument, they play another embouchure on the top of the instrument. You hear some people play and it sounds like they're playing three different saxophones. Um, what I try to do and what I've worked on forever is getting the same sound on all the notes, getting the same sound so that it sounds like the same instrument rather than a bunch of different instruments, you know. So that means really working on air column, really working on staying relaxed in the way I play, keeping my throat open and blowing air. Um, it's very difficult when you are playing things that are hard to play technically on an instrument, on any instrument, and to stay relaxed, right? The only way that you can stay relaxed when you're doing things that are difficult is to play 
them until they become easy. You know, that's how we get better. You take things that are difficult and you work on them over and over again until they become easy. Then you go on to the next thing. There's always a next step. There's always a next phase. It's sort of like eternally, continually preparing for the Olympics. You know, that's why we practice. When somebody's going to be in the Olympics, they don't wait until three weeks before the Olympics and they say, hey, I'm going to do the high jump. You know, I think I'll do the high jump. Uh, where do I fill out an application? <laughs> you know, these people work every day. They have lives, they go to school or they work or they're teachers or they're, or they're doctors or whatever, but they get up every day and two hours, three hours before they even go to work, they work out. They go, they do their job, they come home, they work out, then they go to sleep and every day is like that. And the discipline of playing an instrument well and the discipline of clarity and spontaneity of playing your instrument comes from continuously focusing. Um, what happened with me was when I started playing saxophone when I was 13 and when I was about 13 and a half my mother figured I wasn't going to quit. I started myself in school in the, in the school system and I, I started practicing. So my mother didn't make me practice. Nobody made me practice. I would just practice because it was, I liked it. So my mother realized I wasn't going to quit. So she joined the Columbia Record Club and she bought me a little stereo record player, right? There's a record player here and a speaker over here. So that made it stereo. <laughs> and then she joined the Columbia Record Club at the time. And uh, at the time you joined the Columbia Record Club, the first record you got was a freebie, right? So those of you who are good on your jazz history will know that the freebie that I got that year was a Miles Davis record called Kind of Blue. And that was my first jazz record. So everybody knows what year that was, right? What year was that? 1959. Right, 1959. <laughs> okay, so I heard John Coltrane and that was it. That's all I wanted to do. So I just focused my energy on that. You know, I took my lunch money, I took my, I, I took my allowance money and every week I'd buy a John Coltrane record, right? So then what I would do is I'd put the records on the record player at night a low volume so I didn't drive my folks nuts and as I went to sleep I would listen to Coltrane. So what I did, which I didn't know I was doing, which is a very deep scientific thing, was I, 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 I consciously programmed my subconscious mind to hear intervallically and melodically in that way through that repetition. That's how the mind works anyway. You know, anybody ever hear of Edgar Casey? There was this guy named Edgar Casey that was so incredible, he could lie down, he could sleep with his head on a book, right? And he would wake up and he would know the stuff in the book. That's pretty good, huh? <laughs> that was pretty good. He was, a, he was an amazing person, but it just shows the power of consciousness. So basically, before I knew what scales were, before I knew what chords were, before I knew what anything was harmonically going on, I was doing certain things melodically and in intervallically that I had learned intuitively, you know, because I just wanted to learn how to play. So things that... <laughs> Right? When you listen to that music, when you listen to that sound, there's an intensity in the sound. There's an intensity in the tones. There's a clarity in the sound. You know, like a lot of times people ask me, well, how do you tongue so fast? You know, 
how do you how do, how do you play so fast? How can you articulate those notes so fast? I'm not tonguing those notes, you know. There's a notch, there's a place where everything goes. And if you play clearly, and if you enunciate what you play clearly, it sounds like you're, you're tonguing. It sounds that way. It's, a, it's your ear picks it up that way. There's no way, there's no possible way I could tongue that fast, you know? But because of the clarity of the articulation, it sounds like it. So those are things that I've worked on and worked on and worked on because it's a daily thing. You know, it's like we were talking about before. It's like going to the gym every day, working on these things. Um, when I practice, I have a two hour workout I do every day if I'm not on an airplane. And then after that, I work on tunes and I work on, on playing. But there's certain things that I do in relationship rapport-wise with the saxophone first, you know. You have to wake yourself up when you start to practice. You have to wake your instrument up. A saxophone, and most instruments, play differently as you play them. And then there is a certain velocity that you play. There's a certain wind pressure that when you play, your instrument sings. Underneath, below that velocity of air, the pitch is unstable and you have a tendency to play sharp. Above it, the tone gets blatty and it has a tendency to make the pitch flat. When you find the veloc velocity or whatever you want to call it, the sweet point, on your instrument of where it sings, it also clears up a whole lot of intonation situations, right? Uh, it's also good to practice with a tuner. I practice with a little Korg tuner that I just set on the, the music stand. I just turn it on, set it on the music stand, and then I'll check myself periodically as I'm playing. So different things to do help a lot, <coughs> you know, because when you play, when you play altissimo, it's very easy to play high, play the pitch high, because it is an effort, right? When you're making an effort to do something, your whole body tightens up, your whole body constricts. Your, all your muscles, you know, we carry a lot of stress in our, in our shoulders, right? So all your muscles go like this, they go like that. Your throat closes up, and the air thins out. So, the pitch goes up, right? We are, humans are, where the saxophone starts. The saxophone starts in you. It's all a cavity, right? It's all a tube. It's a tube going up from your diaphragm, through your lungs, through your throat, out into the instrument, okay? If you're tight and constricted, all your muscles close up and you make the tube shorter. And so the pitch goes up. When you relax and open up and open your throat and blow a clean, strong stream of air, the pitch stabilizes because everything is in line. So that's why we practice, you know. You work on things that are difficult until they become easy. When they become easy, your muscles relax. When your muscles relax, the instrument sings. And then the music comes out, you know. So in practicing altissimos, I just practice low and then high, right? Minor thirds. <laughs> talk about we'll talk about this a little bit but I like to work on stacking intervals right so what I'll do is stack two minor 11 chords when I'm working on my when I'm working on my uh, altissimo so I will do Thank <laughs> you. 
You know, trying to play all of those as clean as I can. Those are all minor 11s. It's different every day, you know. Things that are difficult, you slow them down. Uh, you work on them slowly, and then you speed it up. Uh, and like sometimes everything flows, and then sometimes there's a catch. <laughs> Difficulty on the saxophone is going from, when you're fingering, going from having very few fingers down to having a whole bunch of fingers down, right? So it's very good to work on triads, however you work them out. I've worked out things that I do with triads to just keep my technique clear. Uh, on the saxophone, going from B to D, C, D, flat, C sharp to E, those things can have glitches. You can have glitches and so there's a break in the note. So I spend a lot of time on the, on the middle of the instrument, you know. Uh, that's a pattern in six, and it's one three five three one three. I do that just because it's a very it's a very usable and workable way of playing a triad. <laughs> on the palm keys. Right? Clarity on everything. Then the saxophone sounds like one instrument. It doesn't sound like a whole bunch of instruments. It doesn't sound like one area is under control and then another area is all clunky and bunky and falling apart like a junk heap. <laughs> you know? uh, it's all the same instrument. So you have to work in those sections. You have to work with those. Um, I do a lot of very, very basic, rudimentary, triadic playing. Uh, as I progress through my practicing, then I add elements. I start practicing every day just using the interval of a minor third and relating and building off of that. So I start just Right, now what I'm doing is I'm tonguing two notes and then playing the interval. Da, da, ia, da, da, ia. That's the very first thing I do when I start practicing. It does two things. It warms up your tongue, your tonguing, and it gets, starts to get your fingers loose. It starts to get your fluidity free on playing the instrument, right? All of these things that I do are an attempt to clarify my rapport with the instrument, to clarify the way I approach my instrument, right? What we're, tr the end result, what we're trying to do, the end result, improvising, playing jazz, right? 
that's spontaneous composition. That's a tall order, okay? If you are going to compose spontaneously, that means you have to be able to play spontaneously everything or anything that you hear immediately. In order to be able to do that, in order to be able to have that kind of flexibility and that kind of vocabulary, you have to have a total relationship with your instrument. So there are basic ways to practice and disciplines and that helps open up your technique, it opens up your sound, and then when you improvise, you have the freedom to play your instrument because you know everything is working. You know, you're not worried about whether the low B is gonna come out, you're not worried about whether the high G is gonna be sharp, you know? You work those things out so that when you play, the music comes through, right? When you compose spontaneously, you have to be totally free on your instrument. The only way I figure out to come to any kind of total freedom is through discipline. All freedom seems to come through discipline. You know, you, if you're going to break the rules, it's good to know what the rules are, right? Learn the rules. Then you can blow them into smithereens, you know. But if you get caught out on Alpha Centauri and it's not sounding too good, you can come back to something that is acceptable by traditional theories, if you know the traditional theories. So freedom through discipline, very, very, very important. Uh, music, what we do, what we aspire to, our direction, what we're going to. It's not a sport. It's not a hobby. It can be a hobby. Definitely it's not a sport. It's an art form. And it is totally related to how you think about it. You know, uh, things can be as controlled or as free as you can imagine, right? It's up to your imagination, but you have to have control of the idiom in order to play freely, you know? And then you can go in and out, back and forth, on any instrument, on all instruments, you know? So, uh, you know, last night we heard Victor Wooten, Right, we heard the bass players, two, ba two basses and drums. Beautiful music, beautiful music. But when you hear those guys play, when you heard those guys play, you knew that they could play anything that they felt like. They played so well, they played their instruments so well that it was funny, right? Yeah. It was effortless. They played their instruments so well that it was funny. It was like, oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, they're doing that, right? Then you know, you try to do that. Oh. <laughs> that's the mark of a, you know, that's 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 a mark of a master. The mark of a master is somebody that when you hear them play, you make you think any, you anybody could play that. They play so great, they play so clean, they play so clear that everybody thinks, well, yeah, of course. That's the only way to play. <laughs> Everybody plays like that. That's it. Well, that's what kind of happened to me, right? I was a 13-year-old kid. I heard John Coltrane. I heard Eric Dolphy. I heard uh, Cannonball. I heard Bird. I heard all these incredible players. And I just thought that that's the way with the saxophone was supposed to sound. I thought everybody played the saxophone that way. I was like 22 or 23 years old before I realized that the music that I grew up with when I was a kid and didn't know anything was some of the most evolved music that anybody ever played. You know, and I just thought, well, yeah, that's, that's the way the saxophone sounds. All those guys, they sound that way. That must be the way everybody sounds. So then that's what I thought. So then that's what I tried to do, you know? So you come up with things that are related to your environment. That's why it's very, very, very 
and I can't stress enough, very important, what you feed your mind, okay? Everybody is health conscious, everybody's running five miles, everybody's jumping up and down, you know, everybody quits smoking, everybody quits eating meat, everybody quits doing everything, but nobody watches the garbage that they let into their mind, right? What you think is what you are. What you believe is what you create. If you want to be great, you have to surround yourself with greatness. You surround yourself with greatness by creating an environment for yourself that is great. Don't listen to crap. If you listen to crap, you're going to play crap. Right? It ain't rocket science. It ain't rocket science. We are what we think we are, right? If you want to be something other than you are, you tune into that. If you want to step up, then you step away from where you are and you step up. Same thing with music, same thing with everything. You know, it's just a part of, it's just a part of our life. It's your mind. It's an incredible thing. You know, and we and we need to recognize that in ourselves. Um, a guy named Henry Ford said, uh, "This is one of my favorite old adages." He says, "Whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right." <laughs> That's deep. <laughs> That's enough to talk about right there. Um, we're gonna play a little more because. Uh, all of this stuff, all of the music, everything we play is connected with what we think and what we believe. Um, we're going to just play, we're going to play a Charlie Parker tune for you now called Passport. And uh, this is I Got Rhythm in B-flat. But it's a nice tune. Thank <laughs> you. 
I must come back. Yeah. Yeah. Write your congressman. Tell him, tell your congressman that you need to find out about the altered scale. <laughs> and he'll understand. <laughs> yes, we must, have, we must have this man back. <laughs> Thank you so much. You're really a great audience. Uh, I hope I hope this has been a something of And uh, the next time I see you, we'll start where we left off.